Hey guys, it's Biggs. I'm standing here with a very dear friend of mine. You probably recognize her from some of the other videos that we've shown you. And I'm here today at Species Canada. I'm in the secret location. It's like the bat cave of coolness. Now, the very first time I was here, this lovely young lady here was so enamored telling me about this one particular snake species that she's been very successful with. And I was like, yeah, it's not super sexy. But she keeps telling me about this snake and she's basically trying to convince me that this snake species is extremely sexy. And uh, apparently this snake species, she tells me this, and I don't know how much, how factual this is gonna be, but we're gonna test the theory. But she says this snake smells like black licorice. So today, I brought some black licorice. Would you like a piece of black licorice? Sure. Yeah, see? And you're going to pretend to tell me that this delicious confectionery is basically the same as the snake that we're going to be talking about. I think she's wrong. The snakes in question, there's a breeding pair here. There's a breeding pair there. There's more over here. And there's a whole bunch of babies over there, which we're going to show you guys in a bit. So, I know you absolutely love these animals, Cheyenne. What is this besides black snake or liquid snake? <laughs> well, not only do you get the amazing smell from each shed, uh -huh. but they're extremely interactive, both with their keepers and the environment. Arboreal animals, you can set them up naturalistic, which is the preferred way to set them up, because that's where you're going to see more of the natural behaviors that are going to be exhibited. Is their official name licorice snake? That's that's the that's the official <laughs> the, the official binomial nom, nomenclatural name. What is the snake? It's the licorice black tree snake. No, no, no. It's the, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, the Jackson's tree snake or Thrasops jackson eye as the reptile. You get that, community. kids? Thrasops jackson eye. There's a test later. <laughs> as the reptile community dubs them appropriately, and no, they're amazing snakes. And hopefully, we can highlight them and we can help educate you guys and show you that they're not just another they're black snake. Okay guys, it needed to be said, this is an extremely venomous snake. Species Canada, Ivan and Cheyenne, they know the risks. They've taken all the safety precautions and safety measures. They have protocols in place. These guys are known the world over for their work with this species. Now keeping venomous snakes is definitely not for everyone. But if you are going to do it, make sure you do it safely. Make sure you know your, your laws and your bylaws. Don't put yourself at risk and definitely don't put others at risk. So where do these guys actually call home naturally? <laughs> so they're found within Africa. Of course, depending on the species within the genus, some are found in different sections. So these guys you can find within the Dominican Republic, Congo, Mount Maru, similar surrounding areas to that. So it needs a fair, like a rainforest type habitat, exactly, lots of yeah. trees and stuff. Higher elevation as well. And people assume when you're talking African species, they're assuming hot climate. You don't want to keep these guys hot. And that's one of the main problems that many keepers found when they were first acclimating wild caught individuals is they kept them like they would, a, a, you know, a ball python or something. So yeah. they're very warm, warm ambient temps. And that will unfortunately kill your captives. So yeah, these are higher elevation. Yeah, cooler, higher yeah. humidity. So you guys do well with these because the, the environment that you keep them in is the same environment you do with all your isopods and all those yes. other things. So a lot of the animals that you carry in this facility are animals that can tolerate that, that temperature. Is, yeah. What would be that temperature range? So we keep our ambient uh, temps around 73 to 76. Okay. And at nighttime, it'll drop into the high 60s. Okay. So you've we, got a setback thermostat that it, it, you do that change, do. that general yeah. change. We do provide a small hot spot during breeding seasons for cycling, and it may be tops at about 90. Right now there isn't any on these guys, but the T5 lighting gives off quite a bit of heat, and that'll help bring up that ambient temperature a little bit up near the top. The one thing that you guys will see, and I'll show you in some of the little snippets of video, because you know I know we're both really, really sexy, but the really thing that's really cool about these animals I can't, I, I can't help but saying that they almost look like they were something developed by Disney. <laughs> when I, when you, they, they track your movements and they, 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 they move back and forth, but they move back and forth in kind of a cryptic way following you. It doesn't look even naturally fluid. They do it very, very choppy in the way they do it. 
And you're saying they don't really know what that, why that's there. No, there's like there's hypothesis on how people, you know, interpret it. Some people say it has to do something with vision interaction with the surrounding environment. There's still lots of studies to be done, and that's where hopefully, you know, with the breeding groups that I have, we can learn to document, and, you know, figure out what might be causing it or what yep. they're doing. And these are not necessarily strictly nocturnal snakes because they're active during the daytime. Most nocturnal snakes, like some of the other stuff that you yeah. have, that doesn't move at all, no. these guys are extremely active in the daytime. So that is one definitely sexier appeal of this snake and the fact that you actually get to somewhat interact with the species. Yeah. Now, one thing of note about this, this particular animal is this is an exceptionally venomous snake. This is closely related when I did my when I started reading into this thing, thinking, oh, it's just a black snake, it's no yeah. big deal, it's gonna be like working with a king snake. No, this is a its closest rel relative is actually the, the boom slang. Yeah. Now the only thing that's really different between this snake and say a boom slang or how they're related is yes, it's a rear fang snake, but it also does not have the very large saber-like teeth that a boom slang would. So its delivery system is actually much more primitive than that. So. So the danger level, regardless of how toxic their venom may be, the danger level of working with this fish is actually very low. You still do I said give fish, didn't I? You did say I fish. I did say fish. Okay. <laughs> Biggs doesn't know that this, we're, we're talking about snakes today, yeah. not fish. <laughs> you do need to give them respect, though. And I know with all of our adults here, we do proper hook techniques. We make sure we give them as much space as we can. And we take all the precautions that we can as we don't want to... We don't want to be the one person to take a bite. And yep. and you have the safety history. protocols in place we for do. every single yep. species that you work with. I have. Well, I remember seeing them around yeah, and yeah, stuff like that. So the, you know, if you ever are in a position that you decide that you want to keep venomous, make sure you follow the rules and regulations and your bylaws of your city or state. Make sure you follow everything because all it's going to take is one person to take a bite from one of these animals that they think is cool and unique and it'll never happen. And that really is, has massive damaging repercussions to everybody else in this hobby. Yeah. It'll affect us in ways that people can't imagine, unfortunately. But um, there's a venom protocol sheet that you can purchase for these guys. If you are keeping this species in general, it is advisable to yep. to buy that okay. to keep yourself aware. One other factor for the guys, based on the environment that they live in, is they need extremely high humidity. Correct? Yes. Yeah. So we keep these guys at around 60 to 70 percent humidity. Usually they'll get a mist in the morning, or better yet, if you can supply a mist case system on there, it'll help you with cycling and it'll also help bring up that ambient humidity as well. But yeah, that'd make treat it more like a natural system yes. instead of you yeah. coming in with a spray bottle. These guys, so our group's a long-term captive. These guys have been in captivity about three and a half years, this pair specifically. But when you get fresh wild caught, so they will not drink off the bowls at all. So that's where the mist system will help with hydration. They're not going to drink off the collecting the leaves and exactly. stuff like that. That's where yeah. they would find their, yeah, there's no water dishes in nature. No, no. But these guys, thankfully, they've been, you know, captivity for some time. Some time. They are accustomed to elevated water dishes. They still get their mist, but you can get them used to an elevated water system with time. It's not it doesn't much. smell like licorice over here. You know? <laughs> I guess it's kind of like celery. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it smells good. She does have a shed that she showed me earlier, and she says it smells like licorice. We're going to take a look at that in a minute, guys. And as, maybe we should take a look at the babies. This is your, your first generation babies that you got? Yes. And this is this is mom, right? Yes, this is okay. the female here that had the uh, clutch. So she's given us a clutch two years in a row. The clutch prior to that, they were all slugs. But this a slug year, is a dead egg, an yeah. egg that wasn't fertilized and stuff. But the clutch that she gave us last year was... 100% fertile. Everything was good. She gave us 12 beautiful eggs. They went about 110 days, roughly. So <laughs> That's a bit of a wait. <laughs> it is a bit of a wait, especially when you're checking the incubator like every, every you know, four or five days. Yeah. But, um, Nothing yet. <laughs> very interesting shells. I don't have um, any, like, unfortunately, I don't have the eggs shelf to show an example. But very, how do I say it? Very rough, almost textured. Kind the of egg itself. Marker. The egg itself. Okay. Yes. Um, but I can show photos of yeah, that. If you don't know anything about reptile eggs, uh, particularly with snakes and stuff like that, uh, they're not a hard shell egg like a chicken. They're they're kind of almost like a, a leather sack or it something is, like yeah. that. The little kind of an oblong shape and stuff. So to have different textures with them, that's kind of unique mm -hmm. as well. It's hard to explain, but they almost appeared like they had stretch marks all over the top, but not. It's, it's very interesting though. Yeah. Texture-wise. And these guys max out at, at around six foot or less, right? Six, so, six, seven. Yeah. Um, 
I want to say the big male in here, when he stretches himself fully out, he's pushing seven, seven and eight. He's a big boy. Cool. Let's take a look at the babies, guys. So these are the captive bred babies. They're not captive hatched at all. These are true captive bred, which makes them really special for me. These are the babies from mum that we yes. just showed. Yes. Yo, you bet. So they're coming up to a year now, and they're starting to finish up their onogenetic color change. So they start off bright green as babies, beautiful bright green to blue heads, and a green yellowish body. I'm not sure if I can show on the camera, but you can kind of yeah. see how the belly is nice and speckled. Well, we'll show a picture of one of the ones. Mm -hmm. You have lots of the good pictures from exactly. when we saw them when they were fresh little babies. They were very, very striking. Mm -hmm. So now they're kind of going through that color. He's trying to get to the cage, of course. Uh, but no, these babies are, they've been, not the easiest babies to start off, unfortunately. Um, we ended up having to do quite a bit of assist feeding with them. Well, these are one thing we were talking about uh, about the big ones is because they're an arboreal snake. This yep. snakes, these snakes, not only the babies but the adults as well, pose challenges in regards to feeding. They do. So what they kind are, of diet are these guys on? So I would. So right now, currently, they're actually on uh, pinky mice. No assist feeding anymore. They all eat by themselves, but. As babies, I would imagine in the wild, they're dietary specialists. They're going to be feeding on amphibians, small lizards. Unfortunately, in captivity, sometimes as keepers, it's hard for us to provide. Mm -hmm. So other measures, unfortunately, are taken to make sure the baby thrives. But once you get them off the assist feeding, so mouse tails to pinky parts to pinkies in themselves, they do phenomenal. But on the, the adults, you said you weren't feeding the adults on stuff. Not at all. So our groups only get fed on chicks and quail. They get all avian prey. When these, get, when these babies get a little bit larger and they're able to take button quail chicks, for example, they'll be moved on to that and off of rodents. Okay. There's been That's a, a more natural diet, a lot less is. fat content than the, than the rodents would be as well. Yes, rodents are unfortunately very fatty for arboreal yeah. animals and it's not the suggested diet. Um, there was a few keepers who noted in animals, you know, very old long-term animals fed on diets mm -hmm. high in rodents that there was a lot of fat deposits. Yeah not a very healthy situation for an animal that's going to be up in the trees right that's going to be moving around that needs good muscle mass you can, you can see the structure j just their internal structure the way that they can move like that animal is what 16 18 inches long and yeah. even if it just held in one point it could support itself easily almost three quarters of its body length away from whatever it is so you could tell it's truly an arboreal animal and they're very strong little guys at least for their size but they feel hollow um, usually we don't recommend free handling, so I've had these babies since they were hatched, and you Your kind mom. of, kind of, <laughs> kind of, but you kind of get for an idea how the temperament's going to be, what makes them react, as opposed to wild cots. Wild cots, when they come in, can be a little bit unpredictable, but the babies, you kind of have an idea how they're going to tick. Still not something you want to trust 100%, you still do want to watch, but... And their enclosures are pretty simple, eh? They're pretty it straightforward. Is. And you've raised each one from like a little deli cup after it hatched into, and gradually the containers have gotten bigger and bigger. But these are just little uh, like shoe boxes type uh, rubber maids. It You've is. got holes drilled for ventilation, a little glass dish, a little uh, ceramic dish. Ceramic dishes are easy to clean and easy to sterilize, so they make good, uh, easy replacement dishes for, for the enclosures. And then you've looks like you've glued in branches and stuff so that they can perch naturally because they don't want to be just sitting on the ground. No, not at all. It's a simple way to do it. Um, so when they were just hatched out, they were kept in six quart shoe box containers, similar, so you'd have the sticks glued in that they can utilize and fake plants. Of course, as they get bigger, you would need to up their enclosure size. These guys will be going into two by two cubes, or sorry, two by two by three cubes once they get a little bit bigger than this. Yep. And they'll utilize every... And you're using that type of a media. It looks like you're using core or coconut yep. chunks because that's a type of media that retains moisture really, really well, but the media itself is not wet. Not so at all. it's really it's a great media for these type of animals because you need that higher humidity. Yeah, and you don't want to keep these guys on sopping wet substrate. That's where you're going to look into water blisters, infections, things like that. I you love how they do that, that keeled shape with their neck. They do. <laughs> it's a quite little. Well, from what I've noted from the hatchlings and even from the adults, sometimes it's not only a defensive. Thing. Sometimes when they're moving onto a branch or two, they'll puff their body up. Let's show the shed to the camera, and we'll let's see if everybody else can tell whether or not this thing uh, smells like licorice or not. <laughs> okay, what do you think, guys? Does it smell like licorice? So, here's here's your baseline, <laughs> and there's your other one. What do you guys think? 
She swears it smells like licorice. <laughs> We're just going to have to take her word for it. it smells good. <laughs> well, it smells good. Well, I think they're a pretty fascinating animal, and I'm uh, really, really proud to know that I know people like yourselves that are keeping these animals. Everybody always wants to keep the super sexy, super colorful doesn't have to be super dangerous they just want always that ooh and ah type yeah. factor and this animal does in fact have that ooh and ah factor in the fact that it is extremely inquisitive they're all about every single one of the adult cages right now and including the babies they're all out and about and they're watching us and they're watching what we're doing and if we move by their cages they move with us so in that regard i think they're real sexy for that so maybe cheyenne, cheyenne i'll give you a win on this one today mm -hmm.